Hello, and welcome to another episode of Around the Verse, CIG's official weekly look behind the scenes of Star Citizen. I'm Chris Roberts. And I'm Sandy Gardner. We're, what, three weeks away from CitizenCon? Uh, yeah, well, two and a half, really. So uh, everyone's working very hard. They are. And not just on CitizenCon, though. We've got teams hard at work on 2.6, which, as many of you know, includes the long-awaited Star Marine game mode. Yep, no, it'll be good to have in uh, your guys' hands. Uh, we're also aiming to have new flight balance uh, changes uh, going out to the Avocati test group uh, to get some early community feedback, which is just one part of the Arena Commander improvements for 2.6. And we're deep into prep on Performance Capture Shoot for 3.0, which is currently slotted early after CitizenCon, so yes, lots to do. Yeah, in fact, I'm getting on a plane a few days after CitizenCon to do that. Um, so there you go. Very busy. On today's episode, we have Ivo Hersek explaining all the tech that went into the vision stabilization in FPS, which we shared last week with you all. Yeah, everyone really liked that. Um, but first, let's head to our Frankfurt office where Brian Chambers will update us on what they've been working on. Welcome back to Germany. I am Brian Chambers, development director of the Foundry 42 Frankfurt office. This update from Frankfurt, we will start off with the weapons team, where David will walk through some of the recent weapons they've been working on. Hi, my name is David and I'm junior weapons artist here at Foundry42. Today I would like to show you some of the weapons we've been working on for the last couple of weeks. Um, these weapons are still work in progress and could slightly change till the release of Star Marine. We are working on a complete rework of these weapons for Squadron 42. One of our goals is to generate a uniform style for the manufacturers with uh, similar materials and an overall look. It's important for us that you can see what man manufacturer created the weapons from distance, also for gameplay reasons. We were making a polish pass for existing weapons with PBR materials using newest software. And we changed the look of existing weapons and applied the style guides of weapons you will see in the future. So I hope you liked the quick look at the weapons we did for you and see you in the future. Thanks, David. It's always cool to see weapons with their polished paths. Uh, look forward to playing those in game. Um, as you guys know, Star Citizen Universe is vast. Um, and we need to create systems that are going to allow for the scalability so we can populate the universe to the level of detail that we need and have the gameplay in there. With that said, let's go to the level design team where Ben and Tobias will show off some of the modular systems they've been working on. Hello, I'm Ben. I'm a level designer here in Frankfurt and I've been working on a modular system from which we can construct satellites. Satellites can serve a huge number of different purposes and are going to be really cool when they're in game. Um, you can think of all the different gameplay options that can come out of these diverse array of satellites which, uh, which we can build. Now, my job was to develop a system whereby we could build numerous different satellites from a number of modular pieces. The purpose or the function of a satellite will be determined by the modular pieces which it's made up of. So when I started on this modular system, I created a number of test modules which serve different purposes, uh, like one would be shields, another power generation. And in a lot of ways, their functionality is similar to ships, but the difference being on satellites, all of these uh, systems will be automated. It was important when designing these that uh, the silhouettes of the modules were distinctive from one another. What's, what this means is, as a player, when you're arriving at a satellite, you can take a quick look at it and instantly grasp what it does, what, uh, what modules it's made up of, and what its purpose is in the universe. When these individual modules get damaged, their specific functionality uh, will fall out of the satellite. So if it shields, then shields will be down. And then a player will have to EVA over to those modules to fix them and bring that module back online. Other interesting things could be stealing data from a satellite, and this data could be breadcrumbs that lead to a mission. Uh, the size and the shape of the satellites themselves will be influenced by where they are in the universe. For instance, a satellite very close to a sun will need a lot of shielding, it'll need some kind of liquid cooling, all these systems to be able to dissipate the heat into space. You can see it's easy to swap in and out the different modules of the satellite. The hub 
in the middle is the backbone from which all of the other modules branch out. The type of power generation will be dependent on the purpose of the satellites, how much power it needs to pull, and also, for instance, a military satellite will not want to have solar panels because they're liable to get damaged. Each of the modules you can see here has six connection points. This allows the, the satellite to be built out in every different axis. And uh, when the art team have got hold of them, uh, they'll look a lot more attractive and in keeping with the rest of the art style of Star Citizen. Thanks for listening, guys. Bye. Hi, my name is Tobias Jonsson. I'm part of the level design here at Founder 42 in Frankfurt. I have been working on a modular system for small planetary locations for 3.0. Uh, humans have always wanted to inhabit new locations when we find them, and it's the same in space. So for this first iteration, we're just going to have small camps and research facilities that are placed on planets for humans to live and stay. Um, and now I'm going to show you this, how the system is going to work in rough edges here in Kryonin behind me. So with the system that I've designed so far is we're going to build uh, locations in components, pretty much. And we'd start by picking an exterior. As you can see here, I just have a small one. As I just told you, this is what we're aiming for in 3.0. Uh, after you have picked an exterior, you go inside, and you're going to be able to switch between different interiors, depending on what you want the location to be like. Um, so as you can see here, I'm switching between different rooms that we're just going to be able to scroll through fairly quickly. Um, after deciding what we want the location to be, or the building, uh, we can also add some exterior assets to it to make it more extinct and recognizable from far away. Um, this is all used to help, help the gameplay and everything that this is built around so, they, so we can populate planets faster, inhabit planets faster. <laughs> um, and as like that is just what we're aiming for now, but as you can see, this as well can be scaled up to larger buildings with more slots. This is also a building with just one slot, and here we have one that has three room slots where we should be able to switch all the rooms between as we want to. Uh, for 3.0, however, this is more what it's going to look like here, where it's these small camps with just one or two of these uh, smaller buildings and a corridor connecting them so you don't have to go through an airlock every time you walk between buildings. Um, and here we have another one that's just three slots used. Yep. As you saw in that presentation, you see, get an understanding for how we can faster build out locations that we're going to place on planets. We still have to place this manually. Uh, however, this system is going to make it faster so we can fill up the world, making it feel more alive and add more gameplay for you guys. Um, that's all for me this time, and thank you. Thanks, guys. Look forward to seeing all the variants you guys can put together and how we'll eventually encounter them as you jump from planet to planet. Uh, for the rest of the team, they're incredibly busy, and we look forward to showing off more work from other disciplines in the very near future. Um, but for now, that wraps us up for Frankfurt. Appreciate you guys watching, and thank you so much for the support. Thanks, Brian. Um, so those reworked uh, weapons were looking really good. They were. They were looking very cool. I feel like we've talked about modular sets a lot on ATV. Uh, well, you know, it's one of those uh, systems that you have to have when you're making a game of the scale of Star Citizen. Cool. So in the spectrum between completely custom locales, where everything is uh, handcrafted, and the opposite end of the spectrum, which is procedurally generated locations, where would these modular systems fall? Uh, OK, so hopefully best of both worlds. The modular, set, modular sets allow us to build out the different locations really rapidly, and then we dress them up with props and banners and different art to give them sort of an individual feel and character. Nice. So next update, let's check in with Tyler Whitkin for this week's community update. Hey everyone, Tyler Whitkin, Community Manager in the Austin, Texas studio, here to bring you this week's community update. Last week, the Vanguard Warden won the title of Galactic Tour's Combat Ship of the Year, landing at a spot on our pledge store for one week, and that sale will end tomorrow. Fast forward to this week and the battle continues, this time between the Aegis Retaliator and the Anvil Gladiator competing for the coveted title of Galactic Tour's Bomber of the Year. It's looking to be a very close finish, so make sure to log into our website, cast your vote, and we'll post the results tomorrow.
Now, I said it last week, and I'm gonna say it again, the Bar Citizen fever is spreading around the globe. Last Saturday, I had the privilege to attend the Bar Citizen event in Orlando, Florida, and let me tell you, it is an unforgettable experience. Uh, we have some upcoming events, one in Denver, one in New York, and even one in France. You can find out all the details about those events and more at tinyurl.com slash bar citizen. Now, it's convention season. CitizenCon is right around the corner, but first, TwitchCon. Alexis, Ben, Jared, and myself will be present wandering the show floor, so hopefully we'll run into some of you guys while we're there. Last week also brought us a new issue of Jump Point for subscribers packed with awesome content and even a fun in-fiction piece that's definitely worth checking out. Now, it's time for this week's MVP award. A huge congratulations to Uth O'Reilly for his talented efforts in creating some fan Star Citizen music. Browsing through his YouTube channel, piece after piece continued to blow my mind. So congratulations, Utho. You're this week's MVP. And lastly, the week would not be complete without Reverse the Verse. We will be broadcasting live at twitch.tv slash sigcommunity tomorrow at 7 a.m. Pacific Daylight Time. So make sure to tune in to catch all the talk about everything that you saw in today's episode. Thanks again, everyone, for your support, and we'll see you in the verse. Thanks, Tyler. So love the passion and creativity from this community. I mean, they do amazing stuff all the time. They do amazing stuff. In last week's newsletter, the sneak peek was a video demonstrating changes to our vision stabilization system. Yes, so as a first-person universe, the transitions between flight and ground-based gameplay, obviously the player's perspective is an essential element to get that right. So you have it to feel both smooth and realistic. Without motion sickness. Uh, yes, that too. Uh, so anyway, it's been an ongoing uh, process of trial and error to get it right. Very cool. So here's Evo Hersek to explain the tech and the improvements that we've made. Hi, I'm Ivo Herzeg, lead animation engineer at CIG. And today I want to talk about the experiments we did to get the camera stable in the first person view. The first person mode we have in Star Citizen is a bit unusual because it's unified with the third person body and it's also driven by the animations of the third person body. And it took quite a while to get this kind of setup to work. If you just take a camera and put it at a point between the eyes of the third person model and move around, then it's pretty crazy what you get on the screen. So that's how it looks with a camera attached to the head. As soon as you start to move, you get this crazy camera shake and it almost looks like the camera is randomly bouncing around. So this is nothing we can use in the game and it's certainly not how humans perceive motions in real life. But the funny thing is, this is actually the real motion of the head. This is all part of the mocap data. If you take a GoPro camera, attach it to your forehead and move around, then it looks exactly like this. So this means Head motions can be pretty extreme, and it also means that our eyes and our brain are doing a pretty good job to compensate it. That's why we're not even aware that this issue exists in real life. And the first thing we did to improve this was eye stabilization. And that's something we humans do all the time. It's basically a counter-rotation of the eyeballs to compensate for the movements of the head. And this is pretty easy to implement. All you need is a camera with a focus point, and that's just a point in the distance you can control with the mouse when you're aiming. So that's how it looks with eye stabilization. When I move around, everything feels much smoother than before, and the image is now perfectly aligned with the horizon. And by using this focus point, we are actually trying to emulate the biological principle that keeps the image stable on the retina of our eyes. But instead of counter-rotating both eyes, we only counter-rotate the head camera in the direction of the focus point. And with this simple trick, we can eliminate about 80% of all the camera noise. But if you look now on the screen, that you can see the image is still not perfectly smooth. And that's because eye stabilization only works well if you move forward in an open environment and focus at a point in the distance. It doesn't really work when you move close to walls and it's something you can't avoid in narrow corridors and we have lots of them on a space station. It also doesn't work when you strafe in front of walls and strafing is something we do all the time in a first person game. And it looks pretty terrible with all the stop and start motions that we have. So when you start to run, and stop directly in front of an object, then you get this bounce back effect. So all this is nothing new. We already had it in PTU 2.0 and nobody was really happy with the result, mainly because of all the camera noise and the head bobbing. 
And then some people started to complain about motion sickness and for many it was just an immersion killer and not realistic at all. And this all makes sense because eye stabilization, if you look at it as an isolated feature, it can only compensate the rotations of the head and that's it. It doesn't help much with the translations of the head. But that's why we still have all the trouble with the camera. Now, the interesting thing is these head translations, they happen all the time in real life and it's never a problem. When I walk into the kitchen to get a coffee, then my whole body and my head is moving, of course. But the whole motion feels more like floating through the corridor. And maybe that's what we expect to get on the screen. But if I repeat the same experiment with a camera attached to the head, and even if I use exactly the same mocap data, the result on the screen looks more like an earthquake. So this issue was keeping us busy for a while, and we spent some time trying to understand how humans are doing vision stabilization. But it turned out it's a pretty complex mental process, and there wasn't a practical way to get that into a first-person camera. So that was a dead end. And all the techniques to stabilize handheld cameras, they don't work in our case, because our camera is attached to the head and driven by a human body. So we had to find something else. And we found something, it was just a bit unexpected. We learned that birds, or at least most types of birds, they have a pretty interesting problem. They can't roll the eyes around the way humans can. And that makes it a bit hard for them to keep the vision stable and move the body at the same time. If you can't keep your vision stable by moving your eyes, well, then the next logical step is to try to do the opposite and just keep the head stable. And that's what they do. Birds have a long neck, so they just counter-translate all the body motions. It's kind of a camera stabilizer invented by nature. But the really cool thing is that this one operates only on joints. And that means we have a pretty good candidate for an implementation into an animation system. Now, to get all this to work with a human rig in the game, we designed a full-body IK system to control the hands, the legs, and the head independently. And we also use a special IK only for the hands in first person. And what we see here is a combination of eye stabilization with head stabilization. And the um, stabilization itself happens mainly on the head camera, and only for a few extreme motions we distribute the rest over the entire body. And the adjustments on the body are only a couple of centimeters. But as you can see, this is already enough to keep the image perfectly stable on the screen. The unified rig is not the only unusual thing in this shooter. Another pretty big difference is how we spawn the bullets. In a typical shooter, they come from the center of the camera and go to the center of the screen, which means you're actually shooting with your eyes and the gun in your hands has no practical purpose. But in Star Citizen, we spawn the bullets directly from the gun barrel and they changes a few rules. For example, iron sights and scopes don't point directly at the target, so you always need to aim a little bit higher, maybe two or three centimeters. And because now all body motions have a direct impact on the gun barrel, running and shooting doesn't work so well. There's way too much bullet spread going on. And the same goes for recoil. When you're firing too fast while the gun is recoiling, then it's very hard to hit something. And as a player, when you're moving around in a shooter, you always have this gun in front of you. And most of the time, you're not even aware that there actually is a body. And you only notice your own body when you look down at the ground and see your own shadow and how the feet are moving. And that's the moment you realize that the recoil, all the hand animations, all the body animations, every single frame is actually identical in the shadow because it's one single rig and all the animations are shared.
Cascada Industries, the universe's leading producer of commercial class Starliners, is proud to welcome you aboard Port Olisar. Thanks, Evo. So he mentioned in the beginning that most games have different animation sets between first and third person perspectives. Why was it important for you to unify them? Uh, okay, so Star Citizen is a multiplayer game. It's very important to ensure that what you see in first person and what your friend standing next to you sees is the same thing. So we do a lot of things like, for instance, if we, um, you know, where our gun is pointing is exactly where we're going to shoot, as opposed to most first person games where, where the center of the screen is where you're going to shoot. So actually in a lot of first person games, your gun will point not exactly in the same direction as where your bullets will fly. Um, so that's a problem. Uh, but also when you're uh, sitting next to it and I do something, you'll see exactly me doing that thing. And if you wanted to shoot me, not that I hopefully you, you, I would want you to shoot me, um, <laughs> that you would be able to, where I think my body is is where it actually is and where you can hit it and there's a lot of like games that uh, that doesn't happen because they sort of fake the first person view it's different than where the actual physical body is so sometimes you can be playing a first person game and you can be hiding behind cover and then get hit where you wouldn't thought you would have been hit that's because your first person view is actually slightly different than where your body really is so for us because we're a multiplayer game and because there's going to be so many interactions your friends are going to be next to you uh, you know say flying a ship like a Connie or something or you'll be seeing people do stuff that we needed to unify it so whatever the character was actually doing they were doing but it was also what you were seeing in first person and then the problem is if you play say a GoPro on someone's head then and you run around and you look at that footage the footage goes like this and it's really sort of bath inducing it's sort of the Blair Witch yeah. um, uh, you know issue that you saw with the, the sort of ch uh, found camera footage stuff. Uh, so the vision stabilization system basically is mimicking what our brain does when we're bringing in the imagery stuff. Because if you run around, you'll notice your vision's quite stable. And so we spent a lot of time to do that so we can have one unified set of animation and character assets, whether it's first and third person, it just works. And the view that you have uh, is you know, great and, and, and nice and smooth and feels more akin to what you do in, in real life. So uh, not many, in fact, almost no games have done this. I think uh, Arm is one of the few games that have managed to do it. We're very proud of what we've done. It's taken a lot of work. Uh, most people don't try as hard. If we were just doing Squadron 42, we probably wouldn't have done it because that's a single player game. But because Star Citizen is such a multiplayer game, it's super important. So we're very proud. And uh, Evo and the rest of the team doing that did an awesome job. Very cool. I look forward to trying that out. That is it for this week's Around the Verse. As always, we'd like to thank our subscribers whose monthly contributions allow us to make this extra community content. Yeah, thank you guys. And also to all our backers and supporters out there who got us here in the first place. Thank you very, very much, guys. Yes, thank you. And be sure to check in to Reverse the Verse tomorrow at 7 a.m. Pacific, 3 p.m. GMT, or 4 p.m. Frankfurt time, where Brian Chambers will be chatting with Ben Dare and Eva Herzig from this week's episode, as well as revealing some exclusive new footage. Cool. Uh, so on next week's Around the Verse, we'll explain some of the changes to the flight model that you'll see in 2.6. So make sure you check it out. Definitely. And thank Thanks for watching, everyone. We'll see you around, around the verse. The Thank you for watching. So if you want to keep up with the latest and greatest in Star Citizen and Squadron 42's development, please follow us on our social media channels. See you soon.